so I, so I do want to open this to questions uh, um, from all of you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the moderator's privilege and suggest that I have to imagine that the, uh, the, the chase with the bear uh, was not one in which one thought that the other was the only person engaging in it. I, I have to imagine Justice Breyer thought that he was running, uh, even if not necessarily at warp speed. So I want to give through just an opportunity <laughs> to talk a little bit about um, what he thought he was, uh, you know, how, how well he thought he was performing while they're both being chased by the bear. Yeah. So uh, Justice Breyer is actually a pretty competitive guy. And I don't know if, like Justice Scalia, he's ever held or fired a gun. Uh, Justice Scalia has. He has lots of adornments in his chambers that are proof of it. Uh, but, he, um, but in any competition, uh, running from bears or drafting opinions, uh, Justice Breyer takes it, um, that process seriously. I, I uh, commented during the morning session, it's a thing for you guys to know that there's some law professor out there who did a article about how funny the justices are. And they actually looked at um, the, uh, the transcripts of the oral arguments. And they would do a search for the word laughter in like parentheses. And uh, Justice Scalia, according to that very careful study, is the funniest justice uh, of all. Justice Breyer is second, and he does not like that. <laughs> and ever since that article came out, you can see an uptick in his efforts to be funny. Um, he also, I think, uh, wrote the book, Act of Liberty, a few years ago in response to the fact that he realized that folks that uh, were in the camp that Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, in some respects, lead um, were being very convincing to the next generation of law students and lawyers. He realized that people would read these opinions and there was an intuitiveness to saying, look, we shouldn't make judgments based on our own personal preferences. We should look at the text and we should look at what the original framers and the original legislators want and we should do what they want, um, not what we want. And Justice Breyer thought that's a very appealing explanation for what Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas is doing. Um, and it's not that he thinks it was an exercise in bad faith, not at all. I think he very much appreciates that that is what they are trying to accomplish. Um, for Justice Breyer, the concern was that that sometimes led to really troubling and um, damaging results because sometimes what a textual argument suggested was really contrary to the individual rights that were at stake. Sometimes what, if you looked at just what people 227 years wanted, that would be very, very contrary to the overarching purpose of putting a constitution on paper, but also having a foundation that understood that judges would have to interpret it and apply it over many, many years, decades, centuries. And so he wanted to explain that, uh, you know, for all the salesmanship of Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, in getting the message out, he wanted to make sure that there was another message, another explanation for why you could come up with a coherent theory for why you come up with these results. And instead of saying we should always look to see what the words on the page mean, especially because sometimes the words conflict and there's good arguments on both sides and those are the hard cases, he said what we should do is always in those really tough cases think what will advance democracy, what will advance democratic discourse and debate and discussion. And that was his effort to, um, to outrun the bear. I should just add that I think in an actual foot race, I would probably put my money on Justice Breyer. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Scalia fights dirty. I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> that is very true. Trip him or something. Very scrappy. Yeah. Yeah. But I think Justice Breyer actually jogged with his law clerks when yeah. I was there. So. And, in <laughs> and in fact, uh, if one remembers, before uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed to the Supreme Court, Justice Breyer was considered for that seat. He got the next seat. but. He went to the White House and had an interview with President Clinton, and the two of them went running together. Um, so it's, it's, it's not clear whether running has benefited or harmed Justice Breyer, uh, but it didn't harm him enough that it prevented him from getting on the Supreme Court. He just didn't win the first race. Uh, apparently, Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg outran him. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, in any event, uh, so I would like to open this up for some questions from the, uh, from the forum. We do have a, we do have a mic, uh, so if you have questions, uh, Arthur will bring the mic to you. Please, don't be shy. 
Uh, oh, and I've got some, oh, by the way, I'm not texting uh, or emailing here. Uh, Professor Coolish and I have a very elaborate arrangement whereby he is sending me questions that are coming in in real time. Um, What's that? <laughs> okay, so uh, one question that I have is, um, this is so high tech. That's this is very high tech. Are they this, is, this, is, this is quite impressive. Are they uh, this, is, the this is a nice question. Um, what effect, if any, or what influence, if any, do the books have uh, on the court's opinions? Um, and I'll moderate. What effect, if any, might these books have not just on Supreme Court opinions, but on lower court opinions? And I'll throw that out. I mean, I think um, on the Supreme Court, the things that uh, Justice Breyer, Justice Scalia, Justice Stevens is now retired, but you know, still, Justice Stevens are writing their book, are things that the other members of the Supreme Court are already very familiar with from having served with these justices for decades. And so, to a certain extent, I don't think the justices are trying to convince each other. And I don't think that the books are really moving the ball in Supreme Court cases because the disagreements that, you know, Justice Breyer isn't going to read Justice Scalia's book and be like, oh, finally, I, I, I see. I it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that with respect to lower courts and, and you know, not, they can be very influential, uh, judges who are still sort of forming their firm judicial views. And then I think taking a sort of step or 10 below that, they, I think the justices hope, and I think that books are very influential to law students and to, and to young lawyers who, you know, when you come to your first year of law school, you really don't have, at least I, I didn't, a firm opinion on the types of things we've been talking about. And you have to read these different well-developed views and, and figure out what you think for yourself. And I think they both, they're trying to educate. All the justices are in that way. I have uh, two, two quick things to add. I think that's exactly right. The first is, do we have a hashtag? Yes, on? we do. Oh, nice. I've never had a hashtag before. Uh, hashtag is M-O-C-D. Oh, nice. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> I don't that's even know what a hashtag is. <laughs> uh, what is I, I'm excited. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I, I think to, to sort of riff off the last thing that Rebecca said, uh, I think that, uh, look, these books, insofar as they're going to influence the court, are a bank shot. Uh, and the bank shot is you guys. Uh, the bank shot is they're not writing for each other. They are not going to convince each other of what they think. The fight is for the future here. Uh, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the legal discourse set so that 20, 30, 40 years from now, the people that are being trained now when they're in positions of power are going to think what they think is right. Um, so they are really, I think, writing for the future. Uh, Justice Stevens, uh, in the introduction to his book, talks a lot about Constitution Day, the preamble. He says, a more perfect union. He says, the Constitution's not perfect, but we're working on trying to make it more perfect. And I think that each one of these books is an attempt uh, to make it more perfect uh, by training lawyers, and young lawyers in particular, on their school of thought. Uh, so they, I think the books do aim uh, to have an influence. It's just an influence that's going to be difficult to see right now. But look in 15 or 20 years, it could be a different matter. I know you guys are still in college. Have any of you read an opinion by Justice Scalia? You guys had a chance to. So you should, when you get a chance, just pick any old case by Justice Scalia and take a quick look at it. It is an, a work of art. I mean, he's very, very persuasive, and especially for folks that haven't been through three years of law school and practice and seen the arguments and all the sides, especially, and, and it's, not to say, <laughs> it's not to say that their arguments are you know, weaker when you peel back the layer, although arguably they are, um, <laughs> but at first blush, you will read these opinions, you'll be like, you'll kind of yourself almost nodding your head, you'll be like, yeah, that makes sense, that, that makes a lot of sense, oh yeah, I can, God, I can't even believe what the other side would be, and um, that's a really potent force to have on the Supreme Court. And I think a lot of commentators have noted what he has done um, to originalism and textualism. He's really given it sort of a, a really fun voice. He's like the cool hashtag guy for the Supreme Court. And it's, um, it's something that I think other justices um, are trying to keep up with in some respects. And so um, I think that that is, I think Aaron and Rebecca are right. They're not necessarily talking to one another. I will just add one thing. It's a really interesting phenomenon. People talk about um, oral argument and what 
difference does it make for an advocate to be there and sort of making an argument at oral argument when so much briefing has happened in advance. And something that I think a lot of folks don't know is that the justices, almost as a matter of practice or tradition, very rarely will have any conversation among themselves about a case until after argument. And so at argument, there are nine justices sitting there, all of whom have a view at that point because they've read the briefs and they've read bench memos and things like that. And this is their first opportunity in some sense to try to convince one another and to sort of, uh, sort of lobby for a particular position. So you'll find that the advocates and the questions they ask are not really questions to the advocate, and the really good advocates know this, it's actually a question that is directed at Justice Kennedy or directed at Justice Stevens, but the advocate is supposed to be the mouthpiece for that. So Justice Breyer will say, well, wouldn't you say, and then fill in something that he thinks is gonna be persuasive to Justice Kennedy, and the advocate's gonna say, absolutely right, and the really good ones, they look to Justice Kennedy in answering the question, because they know that the audience of that particular conversation is at that point one another. I, sh I should add, if you're, if, you know, there are many, many Supreme Court opinions. Uh, if you want to read a particularly sort of fun, provocative opinion by Justice Scalia, Casey versus Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania, there is a partial concurrence, partial dissent by Justice Scalia that really is a very Scalia-esque uh, drafting exercise. It is punchy, uh, to say the least. And if you're, if you're looking for an example of what Theroux is talking about, that would be a nice one to pick. I could pick others, but that's one that I think you would probably uh, get a good sense of his style uh, from, from, from reading. Rebecca, would you agree with that choice? I agree. I think my all-time favorite is the Morrison dissent. Well, this right. The, the Morrison play. dissent, though, has a little less of the, the kind of uh, rhetorical flourish. It's, yeah. it's, 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 I, I, it's, it's a wonderful piece of argumentation on its merits, but in terms of rhetorical flourish, I, I don't think it quite compares to Casey. And for those yeah. of us who sometimes disagree with Justice Scalia, this is really frustrating, because it's like... <laughs> no, no, look, S Scalia opinions are like onions. There's layer and layer that you can yeah. peel back, and the deeper you get, the more you want to cry. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a couple of questions uh, the high-tech way, but I'd like to take some questions the low-tech way, uh, especially from those of you who are here from College Park. Uh, are there questions that you have? Don't be shy, please. Please. There's no bad questions. How would you say that the, um, the upbringing of all the justices had an effect on their decisions? What, I... It's a great question. It's a really great question. Um, because I think that serving for a justice or working even um, for any employer, you realize that so much of what they do has to do with where they came from and sort of what their upbringing was. Um, I'll just give one example. I know that Justice Breyer, um, his father was a lawyer for the school board in San Francisco. And I think that's one of the reasons why he took so seriously the rights of school boards and local districts to come up with their own governance strategies for combating the problems that they had. Um, I don't know that they're any different than anyone else. You really do sort of, life is so autobiographical in that respect, so the things that matter to you have so much to do with the things that um, you've gone through and that you've experienced. Um, that's just sort of one example. Um, it's a really great question. I wish I had a better example, but I, I think it very much does shape their views. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, not in the sense that I think someone says, consciously, you know, oh, I did such and such growing up, therefore I think X, but we're obviously all compilations of our lived experiences. There's no way around that. In the context of Justice Stevens, something that he's spoken about uh, is he uh, is the only, was the last member of the court to have military service uh, when he was on the bench. He uh, served in World War II. Uh, he likes to say he enlisted and the Japanese responded the next day by bombing Pearl Harbor. Uh, and he, uh, he was actually on the code-breaking team uh, that uh, tracked uh, Yamamoto's plane uh, in World War II. But he's spoken a couple of times about military experience and the way that that sort of impacted his view uh, on, you know, not necessarily in ways you would expect. Sometimes uh, giving a more of a solicitude for the military, sometimes saying, you know, well, I don't buy the military, kind of inflating its 
problems here uh, that, that's going to arise from this. So I think that without a doubt, uh, because you know, there are only so many hours in a day, there's only so many days in a lifetime, uh, I think your experiences certainly influence it. Uh, we were uh, talking, I was talking uh, recently with a clerk uh, from a justice who had discussed how when Justice Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, first African American member of the court, when he joined the court, that that really had a fundamental change in the nature of discussion that was going on because there were, before that, nine white men that came from basically upper or upper middle class backgrounds on the court. And all of a sudden, there was a black man that had been part of the civil rights movement. And there's just no way that that couldn't have contributed a richness and an understanding of what was going on. Just to add one, uh, just want to add one interesting datum. You know, the question of upbringing is interesting, but as uh, Aaron points out, the question of life experience is also interesting. One of the reasons why Justice Powell was supportive uh, of a, a right to abort was that it happened to be the case that his father-in-law was an obstetrician. And so from his life experience in dealing with his father-in-law, he viewed it as a medical decision. He really believed it was a question of sort of medical judgment working in consultation with uh, with, with the woman who was the patient of the obstetrician. Um, and there's no doubt that the women who have served on the court, right, Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Alana Kagan, and Sonia Sotomayor, that their life experience growing up as women it, it had to have affected uh, the nature of the way they look at any broad number of issues dealing specifically with women, but I think it would be naive to imagine it's limited to that. Right, because of the different experiences that uh, men versus women have, and obviously it, it relates to race as well. And if I can add just another example, this is a provocative example, but it's a public example. Um, you know, Justice Thomas uh, is the um, oftentimes uh, votes, I think almost always has voted in decisions against race conscious admissions, uh, affirmative action. Um, at really any level, and he has publicly spoken about his experiences coming out of Yale Law School, um, considered, uh, considering himself a very, very good candidate and convinced himself, and he's publicly spoken about the fact that he couldn't get jobs at law firms, even though he was a great student at a great law school. And a lot of people would say, gosh, that's an example of why affirmative action or race conscious admissions is useful because then to overcome the racial prejudice, you would have been given a chance at some of those institutions. His autobiographical account of it is that because those people assumed that he had gotten to Yale Law School because of affirmative action, they would not judge him on the merits and he therefore couldn't get jobs. And he's publicly spoken about how that was a you know, defining experience for him. And that no doubt, I think, has played a role in his thinking, you know, even as an African-American justice on the Supreme Court, um, as an opponent of things like race conscious admissions and affirmative action. So I have a question, uh, the high tech way. Is the more effective justice one who is a scholar or one who is a, an effective political maneuverer on the court? Um, I'll just, uh, there's, another, there's a second question from the same person, but let's, let's talk about that. What do you think? Um, I mean, I think one thing to note is that, you know, we've been talking about the justices as like scholars in writing their books and as, ju as judges in the court, but actually all of their judicial work is really quite scholarly. Um, they have to dig into these brand new areas of law and fact all the time and they rely heavily on the work of law professors and experts and, you know, they're really sort of engaged with the academy. And I think it is impossible to do the job well and persuasively to your colleagues without that sort of deep substantive scholarship aspect. No amount of, at least I think on today's court, it's fair to say, almost no amount of sort of political maneuvering or you know, friendship or alliances with other justices will compensate for a lack of precedent and, and depth in, in scholarly analysis. Um, that being said, you know, it's certainly, I don't know, I guess one trope about today's court is that Justice Kennedy can really, is often the swing vote and, you know, can often go either way and often sort of makes the difference in a 5-4 case and it's hard to tell which way he's going to go until he's gone. And I think it's fair. <laughs> and, and so, some people say. <laughs> some, some people say. Some might say. And so you definitely see some people 
Um, you do see this in lawyers, the way they make their arguments, and in law, in, and the justices, when they try to persuade each other, you see them sort of couching their scholarly and their legal arguments in a way that may seem appealing to Justice Kennedy. And, and I think that is sort of a more of a political maneuvering, and that is just an artifact of the, the way the court is lined up and Justice Kennedy's position in the middle. Great, we have a question. No, he's gonna give you the mic so that we can all Thank hear you. you. Actually, Brent is off his life experience question. Um, while, I was wa while I was on listening, I heard lots of your backgrounds, you know, mainly Yale. And I'm sure like, <laughs> <laughs> not that hard, is not good. But on uh, that, I'm, I'm, I think, um, I'm just, I, want, I want to know, what is the, do the judges you serve, do they have the same, you know, Ivy League background? And if they do, does that kind of like constrain their life experiences? Because not that, you know, you know, the Yale isn't good, but if you, but it kind of like, it's kind of like a small community and a small. Like, does that kind of small community shape their life experience and their decisions? That's a good question. Yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think it's a problem that we have all uh, justices at this point that have graduated from the same two law schools. Uh, I, I'm not Stevens sure. Stevens Northwestern. Right, ex with the exception of John Paul Stevens, who, well, he's not on the court, but when he was there, he went to Northwestern Law School. And Justice Stevens has said publicly that he thinks we could do with a little more diversity. Um, now, that being said, I loved Yale, grew up in New Haven, it's a great place. <laughs> uh, but look, there's nothing particularly brilliant in the water there about what they're doing. <laughs> lots of great justices that have come from lots of different schools. Uh, in fact, the, uh, everyone's favorite justice of the 20th century is, is Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson, who, interesting fact, was actually our last justice who didn't graduate from law school. Now, he attended Albany for a little bit, but he, he didn't graduate from law school. Uh, so I, I think that my own personal position uh, is that it wouldn't be so bad. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of diversity. I think one of the reasons that you see that right now is because when they go down the list in the confirmation process, they're trying to find as few holes as possible, so they figure that's a safe bet. I would bet, and I could be wrong, but I would bet that of, of the next two justices, regardless of who makes the appointment, Democrat or Republican, that you will get at least one that did not come from Harvard or Yale Law School. Uh, and I think that that will be, a, it, it'll be good. I mean, it, it, it has to be, right? Getting more perspectives for the court, uh, I think, would be helpful. I just should say that um, the Yale thing among the three of us is a, a little bit of just a weird coincidence, too. Like, Law clerks did not all go to Yale by any means, college or law school. I think it's probably fair to say that Justice Scalia himself does not think terribly much of Yale Law School in its sort of rigor in preparing students for the actual practice of law, and in some ways fairly so. So this is a little weird. Uh, but. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I actually, it's a really good question, and it's important actually not to be um, distracted by the credentials that they ended with, um, because their upbringings are also very interesting. And I would worry more about the upbringings that they have had and the fact that there is some diversity, but not as much as one might sort of expect. You know, it was very recently, it was Justice Kagan, who is the first justice on the court that was not a circuit court judge immediately before that. Um, and so she had been a judge for, I mean, all the justices had been judges for a long time before that. And in order to become judges, you sometimes go to fancier law schools. But the fact that, you know, Sonia Sotomayor had a very, um, you know, tough upbringing in, um, in New York. I mean, th that I actually think is, is very valuable. And each of the three of us have, you know, very different backgrounds before college and before law school. And I, I sort of think that, um, it's really important to sort of appreciate the ways in which diversity can sort of play themselves out. And yeah, when, when we're sort of making the joke that I'm the minority here because I went to Harvard, that's a weird joke to make. Um, <laughs> but it's really important to realize that, and, and a lot of us have sort of talked about teaching at this law school and at other law schools. I teach at University of Baltimore Law School up the street in the University of Maryland. And um, I, we've sort of, we're talking about this at lunch about how the very best students from these schools are as good as the very best students at any school in the country. Um, and so although certainly doors have opened for me personally that might not have been open um, had I not gone to the schools that I went to, um, gosh, I'd, you know, I'd trade you know, my top student at UB or my top student at Maryland for a half dozen 
you know, friends of mine at, at my law school, just because that's, that's just the nature of law schools. Now there's so many law schools and there's so many considerations that, going, that go into it. Um, so it's a real mistake to make the assumption on the basis of the law school that those are the, the right people or the best people. Thankfully, there is more to each of them than the places that they graduated from law school, um, which are really in the middle of their careers, right? It's not, it doesn't reflect all the amazing things that they did afterwards or all of the amazing things that got them to get to go to those schools. And the one other thing I'd say is you can also cut it lots of different ways. So, for instance, right now the court is missing a Westerner. There's nobody from west of the Mississippi, really. Uh, the other thing, the court is, has four uh, members of the court that are from four of the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, so maybe it's time to get someone from Staten Island on the court. Uh, but, but, uh, but there are, as Theru said, a lot of different ways of looking at it, too, diversity. I'm going to make a plug for the University of Maryland. I, it so happens that I clerked on the same court that Dean Tobin clerked uh, on. I clerked for Judge Harrison Winter, who the year that I clerked for him, which was 1987 to 88, uh, was the chief judge of that court, and he was a graduate of this very law school, not this very building, but this very law school. And there are many graduates of this excellent law school that are judges, uh, in not, and not only in the Maryland system. I, I, I just want to, I, especially for undergraduates, I, I, I don't want you to come away with the impression that the only uh, sort of movers and shakers in the legal profession are graduates of Yale or Harvard Law School. That is not true. There are many outstanding lawyers that come from law schools throughout the country, including this one, including Baltimore, which was mentioned, and including many others who have gone, to, gone on to have spectacular careers, and I, I don't mean just in terms of uh, making a good living, but I mean in terms of doing good work. Um, and, and that's really important to convey. I don't want you to come away with a misimpression about that. What makes somebody successful in this profession or any other, I don't care what you decide you want to do, what makes somebody successful in any profession is a deep passion for what it is you want to do. That's what drives you. Sure, it's, it's nice to have the credential, but the fact is you can, with passion, succeed uh, in whatever you, whatever you choose, and it's just important to know that. Um, I have another question, the high-tech way, but I'd love to take another one from, from here. Yeah, I'm just curious um, about the, when, when we went through and everybody said, you know, where, where they went to school and everything, uh, you all mentioned that you were part of law reviews, uh, journals in college, um, and I know that those are very important for you know, postgraduate work, even getting your positions as Supreme Court uh, aides like that, but when you're there and you're, you're actually doing that, that work for those journals and those reviews, what did, you, what did you get out of it? Because I know that they're important for resumes, but obviously you did it for other reasons than that, so what did you experience? Are you in college or law school, by the way? I had no idea what a law review was when I was in college. That's, <laughs> that's either super cool or super nerdy. <laughs> I, I mean, so Becca and I were both on, uh, we were both articles editors of uh, Yale Law Journal together. Uh, and uh, look, the first year, the first thing is don't worry about this. That's the first thing. Right now, definitely not something to worry about at this, at this point in your, if you're an undergrad. Uh, so come back in a couple of years. But, Let's, let's take the time warp. Uh, look, the first year of Law Review was really boring for me. Uh, we were doing like really boring stuff. Uh, basically, it involves like site checking, which means you need to look something up to make sure that the citation is what it say, purports to be. Uh, and you have to make sure it's properly formatted. This is really, really boring. It also turns out to be like actually a not unimportant skill. Not so much making sure it's properly formatted, but actually making sure that something says what it purports to say is actually an important lawyerly blocking, blocking and tackling skill. Just like in football, nobody enjoys hitting the sled over and over and over. It's boring. But it actually is good technique because a lot of what you do as a lawyer is look, at this stage, particularly like when we were clerking at the court, if you put in a citation, then it better say what you think it says. Uh, because if it doesn't, it's going to be, they go over those with a fine tooth comb. Uh, so uh, that is, it's a boring, but I think ultimately skill that was worth obtaining. Uh, 
the second year when we were articles editors was much more interesting. Uh, I, you got to read lots of law review articles. To some people, this is great, like me. I'm a law dork. Uh, to some people, this is awful. Uh, you shouldn't be an articles editor. But uh, you got to read a lot of articles, like hundreds. It was almost like the surf pool coming in. There are all these articles coming over the transom. We used to meet, like, Three times a week. Three like times two a week. Hours each time. Yeah, for hours and hours. We would like get dinner and sit there and debate articles. Uh, and then you get to actually work with some of the professors in the editing process. So that was really cool. Uh, so the first year was blocking, tackling, and the second year was, uh, was interesting stuff. So I've got an interesting question here. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure how easy this is going to be for any of you to answer, but we'll give it, we'll give it a go. Um, so it says, in any I'm going to slightly rephrase it. In any particular case, is there a, is there a, a big question that would be asked by Breyer, Scalia, or Stevens that would serve to readily distinguish their differing judicial philosophies? Are there particular questions that they're prone to ask in the same case that reveal something profound about the way they look at things? That's a highly sophisticated question. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Pretty good. Um, so uh, I will say, and I'll, I'll sort of say this a little bit in jest, um, Justice Breyer is oftentimes caricatured for his hypotheticals. Um, he asks these crazy, winding, off the wall, colorful sometimes, weird sometimes uh, hypotheticals. Uh, and you know, there's been like, you know, parodies done of his references to mushrooms and squirrels and all these kind of crazy questions. There was a case about um, uh, a, a strip search of a student and um, he was trying to ask it as a hypothetical and his hypothetical wasn't working so he used himself in the hypothetical and he started saying, well just imagine if I had been hiding something in my underwear and I sometimes, and he, you know, his brother <laughs> called him up who's a judge in California and said, don't you ever do that again, you're making our family look bad. Um, <laughs> and, and so he, he asked these, you know, off the wall hypotheticals. It is revealing that he is so prone to go to hypotheticals. Part of that has to do with the fact that he was a law professor. And the Socratic method in law school is so much uh, based on, you've got your case. Tell me how that case would apply to this hypothetical scenario. That's the way to sort of test and stretch the doctrine. So it's the law professor in him. The other part of for, I think, Justice Breyer, in my view, is that it's him trying to make it clear to the other justices, as well as the advocates, that this case has to be applied, that our decision has to be applied in a lot of different contexts. And if we apply the law in a very different context and it results in something a little crazy, then maybe we really ought to reconsider going that direction with the law. I think for him it's his sort of pragmatic approach to the law, that this decision not only has to answer this case, it certainly does, and that's the most important and paramount consideration, but it also needs to be a workable doctrine for lots of different contexts, including my zany off-the-wall hypotheticals. And so that's my best answer. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, don't have a, I don't have a fun hypothetical, but um, you know, I think one thing that really differentiates like a Justice Scalia from a Justice Breyer are the questions that they ask in each case. Um, both the order in which they ask those questions and sort of like where they stop and which ones they focus on. And so, uh, you know, in a case that involves the application of a federal statute, Justice Scalia will ask, you know, what does the text say? What does that mean? He will read sort of the entire statute to understand that the context in which the particular provision at issue, you know, comes about. and. Uh, and he will read judicial precedents and ask about sort of how courts have interpreted the statute. But what he will not do is go on to ask, you know, what did the legislators say about how the statute might work when they were debating it on the floor of Congress? Or, you know, what did the Congress that passed this statute have in, have in its mind about how it would apply to particular settings? And, you know, those are basically, and you'll see this in briefs, so, you know, advocates know that some justices are asking some questions and some are asking others, and they'll sort of structure their briefs in ways where the justices can quickly focus on the sections that are most interesting to them. 
Um, so, for example, a brief will always have a legislative history section about what people said on the floor of Congress when they're passing a bill, but it's often it, like a contained thing and, you know, I mean, the justice reads everything, but he knows as soon as he gets to that section that that's really a section targeted at Justice Breyer. Um, so he skips it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to answer the question, sort of not answer it, so I, I didn't see Justice Stevens on the bench, right? He doesn't sit uh, anymore. Uh, but I would say, from my understanding of Justice Stevens, the, the most important question he usually asked was the first one uh, of his sort of order of questions. He's actually a quieter person. His character is a little more reticent. He often lets a bunch, not as quiet as Justice Thomas, who doesn't ask any questions, but, but on the quiet side. He's kind of a quiet guy, and he would often let a lot of people ask questions. And then if there was still something that he thought was unclear or a weakness, then he would ask the question. So by the time you got down to it, if he was asking you a question, advocates described, uh, and from sort of both sides of the aisle, opposite views, that it often was like a laser, like right at what the issue was. So often the first question that Justice Stevens asked was the most important. Uh, in terms of Justice Kennedy, for whom I did see a lot of oral argument, uh, in the same way that Justice Breyer and Justice Scalia have different kind of pillars of their jurisprudence. I think Justice Kennedy's uh, jurisprudence, he tends to care a lot about individual liberty uh, and a lot about freedom. And so you'll often hear him asking questions and have briefs that are targeted at those particular, sometimes you can even count the words when you look through and you're like, ah, here now they're getting to the Justice Kennedy argument. But I think that uh, questions about the sort of individual freedom, liberty, and dignity uh, are the ones that really sort of reflect his jurisprudence. So I think we have time for one more question before we break. Please. Hi. Um, so the whole idea of uh, law reviews and different associations and things like that can seem a bit uh, overwhelming sometimes. But uh, as students who are just beginning our undergraduate careers, um, what would you say we should be worrying about and focusing on like right now? <laughs> I, I'm happy to, 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 to offer a couple of reflections on that. Having taught uh, law school for a pretty long time, uh, 22 years, um, and students with all kinds of varied undergraduate backgrounds. And I can say this, and I really sincerely believe it. You can pretty much study anything, come to law school, and excel. Uh, I have a list of preferred things that I th that I that I advise people sometimes to you know if they're if they're open if they're open-minded about what they want to study I you know I, I think uh, there are particular fields that are worth considering but I've had students excel in tremendously varied majors I've had students who are engineers I've had students who were medical doctors before they came to law school I've had students who are architects before they or, or architecture majors before they came to law school political science economics. English uh, runs the gamut. Um, the most important thing is to find the thing that excites you and pursue it vigorously. Because that's really what you're going to take into law school, is that level of attention to detail, broad understanding, intellectual curiosity, and drive. That's what matters. Don't worry if you're thinking about law school, about the relationship between what you're doing as an undergraduate and your legal studies. That's my first piece of advice. Focus on what excites you, take it seriously, be engaged in your community, and be a serious student. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my, my best advice. Um, I think that's really great advice. I, I was essentially a math major in college. I've had those two. Um, <laughs> and I wrote my law school application about math, um, and it's what I really liked in law school. I, will, I mean, it's what I really liked in college. Um, even though I knew all along that I was going to be um, a, uh, a lawyer and I wanted to go to law school, I will tell you, and this was for me a really hard transition, um, I was not a very good writer when I started um, college. I think of myself as a good writer now. Um, but I struggled as a writer when I first started college. And it was something I really had to work on. And it was something I didn't really work on until late college. But I think taking the time in these you know, wonderful, great years where you can both party and make friends, but also have a moment 
to exercise the muscles that are needed to be a good writer, it's a great way to spend some time. So if you can find opportunities to write and sort of find your voice and find confidence in your voice, I think that can make a really big difference. I didn't get that until much later and I, I know I wish I'd had it earlier. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. You know, your path does not have to be sort of a straight arrow by any means. I, when I was in college, I sort of resisted the idea of being a lawyer because both of my parents are lawyers and I was like, I could think of something else to do, right? And I was an investment banker after college and I hated that so much and I quit it after a year. I moved to a horse farm and I became a professional horseback rider. Then I like went to India for a long time and then finally I just caved and went to law school. <laughs> and you know, so it, it, it can work out. And, but the, the unifying theme is that each time I was like picking something that I thought I was gonna love, um, it turned out I just wasn't, I did love the horseback riding, I'm just not good enough to do it professionally, but, <laughs> uh, and, and, and finally I sort of settled on where I am now, but it's not a straight, straight road. Yeah, I, I'm with, oh, sorry, David, do, uh, well, it might be a while, no, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I, I'm with Becca, uh, I, uh, before going to law school, the year that I had between college and law school, I was actually a, a deckhand on a sailboat on a tall ship uh, in Brazil. And, and I would have stayed there. It just turns out you can't make a living uh, as a sailboat deckhand, uh, unfortunately. So I became a lawyer. Uh, but I do think that the most important thing is, uh, as Professor Stern said, find something you're passionate about and you care about. And I think that the uh, instrumental wrinkle to that is you'll, you'll do better in it, too. I mean, if you really care about it and you're interested in it, you're going to do better. And I know it sounds kind of like the party line or whatever, but it's really true. If you really enjoy the academic area you're in, you're going to be more successful. Now, look, you know, that takes you only so far. Like, if it were up to me right now, I would be the closing, you know, the closer for the Boston Red Sox. But, you know, at some point you have to say you have strengths and weaknesses. This uh, year you might be able to do that. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's looking good. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. We're, it could be. Last game of the season. I'm waiting for the call. Uh, I, I think the one other skill-based thing I would add is in addition to writing, and I think writing is, is really important to learn how to write, uh, learn how to write. Uh, is reading uh, is also a really important skill and you can get that in almost any discipline that you're studying in college. Uh, if I went back and redid it, for a little bit in college I used to be very proud that I could read not that much and sort of bluff my way through what I was doing uh, and I was like very proud of this and I think I like shortchanged myself uh, out of a bit of an education that way. I kind of got the point after a little while uh, but you know, even if you can hit the sort of instrumental, you're getting good grades, you're doing fine and that sort of thing, you, you want to learn how to read uh, because that's also a, a skill, learning how to read carefully, uh, learning how to get through a decent amount of material and really understand it deeply uh, is a skill and you're not going to really have any other time in your life where you're just going to have lots of time to sit down and, and struggle with things. So in addition to writing, I would say work on reading. We, we do need to break, but I, I can't resist making this one last, um, this w one last comment. Um, David, do you have a question? You're... Oh, go ahead. with your professors. Um, it's, uh, it's also a skill, making uh, those kinds of professional relationships, and it's one that uh, will carry you for the rest of your, your life and career. And it's also fun, because we turn out to be, at least how hopefully, warm, engaging, interesting people. I, I, I couldn't agree more. That's, that's great advice. The one thing that I was going to just add to all of this, and I, I just really encourage you, absolutely read, absolutely work in your writing. When you're reading, Read things that challenge your thinking, not just things that reinforce what you already think you know, right? Uh, for example, in reading the newspaper, find columnists who you are inclined to think you disagree with and read them regularly, in addition to the ones that you're inclined to think you do agree with. It'll make you smarter.
It'll make you sharper. It may not change your opinion, but it will make your opinion more thoughtful and informed, and that ultimately will make you better at whatever you do. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the panelists especially, um, and we will have a uh, chance to chat informally out of the Moot Courtroom. Thank you. Thank you.